Right, this week we is doing uh, the intervertebral discs, so the discs between the vertebrae. There are a lot of them. This is kind of my, one of my comfortable places because I used to be a cartilage biologist and we got some funky cartilage connective tissue stuff going on in here. Um, see a little bit more with this one. I know what I can use this for. I know a lot of models show in the same thing, but I can get the different bits on different models and they do show slightly different things. Lovely. And these are the models that tend to fall over. So the intervertebral disc, why are they there? What do they do? What's their structure? And what happens when they fail? I'd say there are a few things to notice to start with. Um, so if we look along the vertebral column here, we see lots of intervertebral discs. Uh, and we notice that the interval, intervertebral discs up in the cervical region are smaller than the intervertebral discs down in the lumbar region. These are much larger. Um, and we also see a difference in the thorax. So um, the intervertebral disc, the joint between these bones, um, allows a little bit of movement. Each joint allows a little bit of movement, but when you add all of these bones up, you get quite a big range of movement, don't you? So that's what the intervertebral discs are for. So that's, that's one purpose of the intervertebral joints. These are joints between bones, and we want these bones to move because then we can move. This is the axial skeleton. Pretty much everything is hanging off this. And we have quite a lot of movement in the neck, in the cervical region. It's highly mobile, isn't it? We don't have so much movement in the thoracic region, and then we have a lot of movement again in the lumbar region, right? You know, for bowing to the queen and stuff. Um, the joint between the vertebrae, so the intervertebral joint comprises the intervertebral disc and a whole bunch of ligaments. And we've, we talked about the ligaments elsewhere? Probably, if not, I'll add it to my list. Um, but the intervertebral disc then is also a shock absorber. So we've got a lot of weight going through the vertebral column and with walking and running and jumping and that sort of thing, uh, we get load and some of that load is applied quite rapidly. So we get shock. So these are actually squidgy pads, these intervertebral discs. Um, so they absorb that shock and we'll talk about how they're squidgy pads and how that works in a bit. I'm gonna go and shut those blinds because that's really bright, isn't it? bit better. I think the anatomy lab should have a lot of natural light because of the things we're looking at and it looks so much better. Um, but hey, let's have a little bit of lighting control <laughs> for this, right? Where was I? So these intervertebral discs are deformable, which means that when you're stood up all day, they slowly compress, they get squashed. So you get a bit shorter during the day. And then at night when you're led down and they're not loaded anymore, they, um, they get a little bit longer. So you get a bit taller every night and then a bit shorter. And it's probably one of the reasons why you get shorter with age, not so much because of that, but because of changes to the connective tissue. Uh, and these joints get called secondary cartilaginous joints, also uh, a symphysis. So we see symphyses, we see these symphysis joints in the midline. The other big one is the pubic symphysis, right? Down here is the pubic symphysis, right? So these are all in the midline. These are all secondary cartilaginous joints and symphysis joints. Now, have you ever looked at a skeleton and noticed that, although we've got all these intervertebral discs, there isn't one, I haven't picked the best skeleton to do this with, but there isn't one, see what I mean? Different things, showing different things. Uh, there's C1, there's C2, so atlas and axis, the top two cervical vertebrae. There's no intervertebral disc between them. There is between C2 and 3, and 3 and 4, and it's all the way down, but not between C1 and C2 vertebrae. Also down the other end, 
The last intervertebral disc is between the L5 vertebra, the last lumbar vertebra, and the first sacral vertebra. And then there aren't any functioning intervertebral discs in the sacrum, and there aren't any intervertebral discs in the coccyx, all right? So we, there aren't intervertebral discs between every vertebral intervertebral joint. I would put money on something falling over before the end of this video. Now, each intervertebral disc has quite a cool and quite a simple structure. It has an annulus fibrosis, a ring around the outside. So the bit we can see here, this is the annulus fibrosis. And uh, the annulus fibrosis is largely type 1 collagen, um, so it's making uh, concentric, so rings of sheets of collagen. Uh, and it's got fibroblasts in there maintaining that collagen, so it's making a ring, hence annulus, because ring, anus means ring, right? So annulus fibrosis, it's a fibrous ring around the outside of the intervertebral disc. So that's very good at um, resisting tensile forces, right? So it doesn't really want to, it doesn't want to stretch. It's very good at keeping its, its round shape, but it's not so good at compressible forces, you know, if you, if you squash it in like, in this direction. So that's the annulus fibrosis. It's got loads and loads of collagen, not a lot of proteoglycans, and the collagen fibers are running like this direction, right? So they're running, they're not running in a ring around there, they're kind of running like this. There's one layer like that, and there's another layer like that. So it's really, really tough, you know, it's like a bloody Kevlar vest or something, you know, it's a really, really tough material. And then inside here, in there, we have the nucleus pulposus, which is the gel bit, that's the very squidgy bit. And that is a bit more like cartilage, it's filled with type 2 collagen, loads of proteoglycans, loads of agrocan, um, uh, and then the cells in there are a bit more chondrocyte-like, they're a little bit more cartilage cell-like because they're maintaining all of that stuff. And also, actually, interestingly, the intervertebral disc is avascular. There are no blood vessels running into it, just like cartilage. Um, there are blood vessels within the bone, and where the... So if we... The body of the vertebra, the vertebral body here, the, the, the cap of it, like the top of it, the bit that is interfacing, the bit that joins to the intervertebral disc, that gets called the end plate, and that's got a load of capillaries in it, but that's where they end, which means that um, nutrients and oxygen and CO2 and stuff have got to diffuse through the intervertebral disc to nourish the cells and remove metabolites, just like in cartilage. So the cells in here are very good at being hypoxic. They're quite cool in a low, low oxygen environment. They're quite happy with that. Um, now what we have, so in here, with all of those cool things going on, is that the type two collagen doesn't form a sheet. It makes like a mesh, like a string bag. And inside that string bag, you have agrocan, a proteoglycan, and what that, what agrocan is good at is, is pulling water in. It's very hydrophilic, so it sucks the water in and holds onto it. So now what you've got, you've got like a mesh bag of balloons, right? So if you, if you squidge, if you push down on that, on the nucleus pulposus, you're pushing down on water that's being held onto by agrocan that can't get squished away because the agrocan's being held in place by all the collagen, right? So you get this really, really good compressible gel. So you squidge it, it's deformable, and then it goes back to its original shape. So that's the shock absorbing bit. So that the nucleus pulposus, nucleus, yeah, pulpo, yeah, um, is in the middle. That's the shock absorbing bit, and it's held in place then by the annulus fibrosus. That's the job of the annulus fibrosus then is to is to keep the squidgy bit in the middle. Um, and it's when the annulus fibrosus fails, <laughs> squidgy bit gets out, that you start to have problems with your intervertebral discs and with your back and pain and stuff. Incidentally, that the end plate, the, uh, the surface of the vertebral body that's articulating with the intervertebral disc is covered with a, like a higher line cartilage. So you've kind of got bone cartilage intervertebral disc. It's proper joint, right? Which is good, because these things got to last a long time, they've got to do a lot of work. Mine, uh, yeah, mine get a bit tight sometimes. Um, right, so the nucleus pulposus then gets squashed 
by low. So as I'm standing up, gravity, the weight of my body is, is squashing the nucleus pulposus. It's got a little bit of load on it. Now, um, if I was to lift a weight, if I was carrying two big bags of shopping, I'd be increasing the load on my nucleus pulposus to get squished a bit more. I think the worst thing you can, or the, the, the most load you can do is like if you're, if you're, if you're sat down and then you lean forward and then you've got weights in your arms and I'm bending my, that's when you like, you load some of these intervertebral discs, nucleus pulposus is maximally, that's like a bad thing to do. Um, and then of course load is lowest when you're, when you're led down, when, or if you're in space. So hopefully you know that you've got to be careful when lifting heavy loads. I'll show you why. So when you, um, you want to you keep your back nice and straight. And of course we say straight, but the back isn't straight. It's, it's curved, right? It's, um, this guy is quite heavily curved, but the back does have a curve to it by straight. You know, you know what I mean? Standing up straight, like your mother told you to do when you were little. Um, so when you're lifting a heavy load, you want to keep your back in that kind of neutral position. And you want to lift for your legs. Your legs are strong. That's why they've got all these big muscles we were looking at, is like, so you can lift things. You don't want to bend your back and then and then lift things because that is going to cause you problems. Um, the reason why is um, what well, we're really the the the, uh, the intervertebral discs that are most commonly damaged in this way are the the the, the intervertebral discs between the lumbar vertebrae, and I think it's most commonly like um, these lower ones, like between L4 and L5 or L5 and S1. And if I right see this disc. Look what happens when I bend my back. So look, this side is getting really squashed and this side is not getting squashed. It means there's a load and load of compression here, way too much compression, which means that the nucleus pulposus wants to try to get, it's getting pushed that way, it's getting squashed posteriorly, right? I mean, if you had an Oreo, right, and you squidge it at one end, what happens to the cream? <laughs> I can't do that demo, we can't bring food into the lab. <laughs> but, uh, so that's what you tend to see, is that um, if the, um, the nucleus pulposus is under a lot of compressor and a really high compressive load um, and there's a weakness in the annulus fibrosus, the ring that's supposed to be retaining and holding the nucleus pulposus in place, the nucleus pulposus will, get either, will either cause a bulge in the uh, annulus fibrosus which is supposed to be attached to the bone here, but if there's a weakening, it might bulge outwards, or it might burst, it might herniate completely, and you get nucleus pulposus pushing out through the annulus, um, which is what you see here. And this leads to another bit of anatomy to consider with the intervertebral disc, is that, look, we've got these spinal nerves popping out here, so the... That is an intervertebral foramen, that's an intervertebral foramen, that's an intervertebral foramen. Much of the intervertebral foramen's walls are made up by adjacent vertebrae, right? But look, the anterior, the anterior wall of that intervertebral foramen is formed by the intervertebral disc. So if the nucleus pulposus herniates out through the fibrosus, if the intervertebral disc herniates, which is what we see here and we get this bulge, it's going to press on the spinal nerve as it's coming through the intervertebral foramen, which is why this is so bad. And of course we've got the, the spinal cord, which becomes the um, chorda equina at this level, um, posteriorly, which means that if we get a what's called a slipped disc, um, except it's not really a slipped disc, is it? It's a, it's a herniated intervertebral disc. If it fails, then it might push out onto the spinal cord or the chorda equina, depending upon the level. So you've got to watch out for those symptoms. But it's it, but because that's kind of um, reinforced by ligaments and what have you, it's more likely to protrude posterolaterally, so onto the 
onto the, um, the spinal nerve. So this is going to cause a lot of pain. Um, some of the pain is going to be caused by uh, damage to the annulus fibrosis, which has some sensory fibers around the outside. Some of the pain is going to be caused by inflammation um, in the local area, and some of the pain, that's, that's got like the local pain, but then, and some of the pain is going to be caused by irritation to the nerve, but that's where you get, you know, uh, like pains in the lower limb, referred pain, because as the nerve gets compressed, gets irritated, the pain is perceived in whatever region of the body is being innervated by that nerve. If it's low down in the back, then we're talking the lower limbs, aren't we? So, discs in young people tend to be really strong. This whole intervertebral disc and intervertebral joint thing tends to be really strong. So if you lift badly, you might get away with it when you're young, but it's not recommended because if you still, if you push it hard enough, you'll still damage yourself. Um, but as we get older, as we, as we see elsewhere in the body, connective tissue gets a bit crapper as we get older. Uh, fibroblasts get less active and what have you. And what we see in the intervertebral discs is they hold less water. Um, I think the proteoglycan content goes down. Uh, the disc becomes more like fibrocartilage. So it gets stiffer. All those important compressible, deformable. So there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of uh, tissue, there's a lot of engineering and physics terms going, or going, going on in here, like deformability and creep. And what's the other good one? Um, hysteresis. So anyway, as we get older, as these become more like fibrocartilage and less like intervertebral discs, they have less water, um, and that, that normal function of the young intervertebral disc is lost, then we're more likely to damage it because it's stiffer. Uh, it's more likely to get a prolapsed disc if you if you lift badly. But nonetheless, age aside, you should be um, careful of your back. Right, that's it, I think. So the intervertebral disc, um, those are the key ideas of the annulus fibrosus, the ring around the outside, retaining the squidgy nucleus pulposus in the middle, which is full of proteoglycans and water, which is why it's squidgy, and we've got loads of cool collagen and stuff holding it all together. And they're attached to um, adjacent vertebrae and they're avascular, so um, nutrients and oxygen and CO2 and stuff have to diffuse through the nucleus pulposus to the cells and back. And a herniation, you've got to think about the other relevant anatomy around here, spinal cord, cordoroquina, spinal nerves. All right, all right, okay.